Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today it is the 30th of October and today I will be talking about the offensive operations by Russia around Vukhodar. So just for some context because I really haven't talked about this area much. This area is just the southwest of Donetsk. You can see that really there haven't been many changes to the front line over here since March. In March the DPR forces in uh, tandem with the Russians were able to take the key city of Volnovaka and then from there there was some back and forth fighting but eventually the DPR and Russian forces were able to expand their uh, control a bit further north and actually reach the outskirts of Vukhodar. From there the Ukrainians were able to uh, capitalize upon their Donbass war fortifications and some of their mobilized reserves that have been uh, trained and sent to the front lines and they were able to build a new defensive line based around Velika Novosilka and this entire highway over here that I'm going over in red towards Vukhodar. And so that was able to prevent any sort of additional Russian breakthroughs and really there was just a uh, status quo situation in this area throughout the entirety of April, May, June and then going into the summer months, the Ukrainians actually did regain some ground over here. They took the towns of Mikilske, they reached Yaharivka, Shevchenkove, Novomayorske, and of course they took Pavlivka. And so the Russians, using some reinforcements from the Pacific Fleet Marines, they were able to retake most of these towns. But the one notable exception is Pavlivka. The Ukrainians were able to turn this into a stronghold and they were able to hold their ground over here despite numerous assaults by DPR troops, specifically from the Kazkad Battalion, which is one of the most important units on the Russian side that is engaged in fighting over here. But anyway, now we've actually seen the Russians go on the offensive over here, which is very interesting because the russians they finished with their mobilization very recently and the russian ministry of defense they claimed that about forty thousand troops are now actively being sent to the front lines and being absorbed into pre-existing units and so it is certainly a possibility that a lot of these new recruits are being moved into the front line around donetsk just as a way to expand the buffer zone going into winter to finally get rid of Avdivka, to take over areas like Novomikhailivka, Korakove, Krasnohorivka. That is certainly something that uh, is possible. And I did talk about this many months ago in the summer when I was discussing Russian strategies. And so it seems as if now Russia is actually planning to implement this. I'm not sure if this is the beginning of their offensives or if this is just a way to pin down Ukrainian troops in a certain area to prevent them from breaking through in Kharkiv and Luhansk or in Kherson. But anyway, let's get into the actual events. So really this started on the night of October 28th going into the morning of October 29th. That is when there were reports from Russian sources that KA-52 helicopters and Su-25s and Su-34s were airborne and they were attacking Ukrainian positions in Pavlivka and in Vukhodar. There was also mention of the TOS-1 rocket launcher, which probably had thermobaric warheads installed. And so remember, these flamethrowers, that's the nickname for this multiple rocket launcher system, were used to really... Uh, a, a very big effect in Pesky. If you remember, that was an urban type settlement just to the west of Donetsk over here. And so the Russians, after all the civilians had already left, they started using the TOS-1 and they were able to flatten a lot of the residential buildings, a lot of the apartments in the area that were being used by Ukraine to bog down the Russian advance. It was also used in the Kherson area when the Russian uh, paratroopers took over Blahodatne in uh, August, if I recall correctly. So again, you see this pattern where it's used against these uh, more dense towns where there are apartment buildings 
and where there aren't many civilians because it doesn't inflict a lot of damage. And so it would be perfect for a place like Pavlivka, where according to our Russian sources, there were only 32 people left. Now it's probably less. But uh, those were all elderly people, most of the civilians in this 1,000-man uh, town had already evacuated. And so you can see that there are a lot of compounds for farming. You can see that there are some like residential blocks. And then in Vukhlar specifically, there are a lot of apartment buildings. And so I actually want to look at some images from uh, Vukhlar just so you can get an idea of how it looks like right now. So here you can see the destruction that all of the town is suffering. You can see that it's been really damaged by heavy shelling a lot of these stores, a lot of these houses. Here are some of the apartment buildings. And so you can see Ukraine is probably using this for sniper fire to get accurate information about Russian positions. Maybe they're launching mortars from up here. And so it is very uh, a very advantageous position. And I know that there aren't really that many apartment buildings in the towns on the front line that are under Russian control. So at least in that regard, the Ukrainians do have an advantage. And so you can see that a lot of these apartment buildings do have some damage to them, but for the most part, they are still standing. And uh, also you have this photo over here. So yeah, it's clearly been damaged, but this will only be the beginning of the damage that these two towns suffer as we go into the future. Okay, so according to the Russian sources, there was some heavy fire from the adjacent B field guns, and this was really aimed at the eastern outskirts of Pavlivka. So you had this artillery barrage that was going on, and that was followed by a Russian assault, which was launched from Yehorivka and pushed towards the southern outskirts of Pavlivka, fighting in the southern streets over there, and also towards the eastern outskirts. So that was what happened yesterday. And also, according to the same Russian sources, they uh, claimed that they were able to destroy the headquarters and electronic intelligence center of the 1st Special Purpose Brigade of the Ukrainian National Guard. And so this is the first time I've ever heard of this unit being active in this area. And so I was able to map out their positions as a result. Here is their position in case you were interested. And in addition, there were some nighttime air raids on Vukhodar specifically. And in those air raids, there was some heavy damage done to the 1st and 2nd mechanized battalions of the, uh, I think it was the 53rd Mechanized Brigade. And so they are also stationed in this area. And in addition, Russia used a lot of these Lancet drones. Recently, Russia has gotten a large batch of these uh, after they were produced in by, by the Russian military industrial complex and were moved into the front lines. And so the Lancet drones that they're using uh, in the Russia-Ukraine war are sort of different from the original Lancet 1s and Lancet 3s. They have about an hour flight time, and they have a 5 kilogram payload, and they could theoretically have a thermobaric warhead, so I'm sure that's going to be used in both of these settlements if it hasn't already. And they also can have a high explosive anti-tank charge, and so that could like pierce through a lot of the thick armor on the tanks or on the infantry fighting vehicles. It could also be used against air defense systems or against, say, artillery systems that Ukraine has. They have a lot of M777s in this area, but it's really not enough to have uh, artillery superiority because really in this area, and this is something that both the Russian and Ukrainian sources agree on, the Russians do have a much larger amount of artillery. They have much more rounds. And so they're able to expend a lot more and inflict much more damage onto their enemies. And so this is one of the reasons why Ukraine was never able to counterattack in this area and why Russia is now actually able to advance a little bit. And so the Russian sources, they actually report that two Buk M1 systems were damaged due to the Lancet drones. I don't know if that's true, but it is interesting to note that these um, air defense systems are being used and they're stationed around the Ukrainian artillery, like the M777s, in order to prevent those from being destroyed. 
in addition to all of this the ukrainians are sending in a lot of reinforcements in, er in order to prevent a major breakthrough so in this area you already had the 24th separate assault battalion which is a part of the 53rd mechanized brigade um, this is actually the idar battalion as it was previously known as and now is integrated into this uh, mechanized unit also you have the 43rd heavy artillery brigade which is responsible for the counter battery operations as uh, russia rains down shelling onto these cities you also have of course the 110th mechanized regiments and the 529th mechanized regiments of the 93rd mechanized brigade which is interesting because the 93rd brigade it is one of the best units in the ukrainian armed forces and it was operating around bakhmut they were able to really hold on to their defensive positions for a very long time and now you're actually seeing some of their um, regiments and battalions being moved into the Vukhodar front in order to um, stabilize the situation there then of course you have the first special purpose brigade which i mentioned before and you have the uh 68th jagger brigade which is stationed in the area around boho yalanivka and this town over here in over ukrainka now moving on the russians on october 30th they were able to advance in the area to the east of pavlivka and to the south of nova mikhailivka so really this entire polygon over here was uh taken over by the russians minus solotke so i actually had the um russian lines overestimated i gave them more land than they originally had but uh in this recent offensive they were able to take over all these areas that i'm about to highlight over here uh roughly and so a lot of this area is just open fields farmland and stuff like that but there are a few um sporadic compounds over there for like farming and i'm sure that those areas were turned into like defensive fortifications by the ukrainians trench lines based around the uh, hedgerows over here and based around the different paths that you can see as i'm going to highlight over here i'm sure that all of this was utilized by the ukrainians to defend this area but they were overrun by russian artillery most likely there's actually a video released by the wagner group which uh, is interesting that the Wagner group is even operating this far south, but it was from the Wagner group and it was like in the general vicinity of Novomikhailivka. I'm pretty sure the video was from um, a bit north of Novomikhailivka, just based on the uh, based on the fields that were shown in the video. It looks a lot like it was from this area, and you can see how the Wagner group is just constantly shelling the Ukrainian positions, which are located within these trees and hedgerows and you can see they're like uh foxholes in there they're just being used to hide from the enemy fire and so that also implies that the wagner group at least has some troops involved in this new push over here so yeah the russians were able to reach the southern outskirts of nova mikhailivka the fighting now is just centered around this agricultural enterprise over here and then looking at the open fields, the Russians are advancing towards the road from Pavlivka to Kostyantanivka. And taking this would really be a big blow to Ukraine's supply lines in this area. It would make it um, the supply of troops and equipment and reinforcements and all of that uh, much more difficult. And so the Russians are probably looking into uh, making the front lines look a bit more like this. And so in order to get a solid control over this road over here, they would first of all need to take over this town, Vodiane. Um, that is certainly possible. It is a relatively small town, but I'm sure that the Ukrainians have fortified it over these months. You can see that, again, it does have some uh, residential buildings and some uh, agricultural enterprises, but there's also a coal mine on the western part of the town which is connected to the main coal mine which is called the Yuzhino Donbaskaya one coal mine so there are a few other ones in this area and so this is a ukrainian uh, hub for defenses and so if the russians want to get control of this road they really do need to take over first of all these uh small houses over here and then advance onto the coal mine itself 
take it over. And then from there, what they can do is they can use the road to their advantage and actually flank Vukhodar in a semicircle and uh, attack it from the east. And so this would be done in tandem with the attacks on Pavlivka. Right now, the Russian sources are saying that they have control of about 50% of Pavlivka. Some are saying that they have full control, but I do highly doubt this. We have seen really zero footage from these uh, offensives. But the reason why I believe them is because I also saw a lot of Ukrainian sources mention that there was fighting within Pavlivka. And so really, my map has the line at uh, around this highway over here. Um, so about 50-50, about if the Ukrainians are forced to leave Pavlivka, which could certainly happen given the Russian artillery superiority, then this would put Vukhodar in a very precarious position as they would be um, sort of enveloped from uh, this side over here from the east, from the south. And so really their, um, really their only way of retreat would be going north because there isn't really a good route to retreat from the uh, west. And so there are a few like minor paths they can take, but the retreat itself could be pretty bloody as they would be exposed to a lot of Russian drone and artillery fire. So it certainly is possible that they'll try to hold out for as long as possible, send in reinforcements, uh, potentially from the 68th Jagger Brigade or from some other units in, uh, in and around Bakhmut just in order to stabilize the situation. Uh, that is also certainly possible. In terms of Russia's uh, battle plans over here, this is all a part of expanding the buffer zone around Donetsk, finally taking over the rest of Donbass. And I did talk about this even in the summer. They first want to, of course, solidify control of this highway from Velika Novosilka uh, to Pavlivka. And so in order to do this, they need to obviously take Pavlivka, Prestivka, Zolotonivia. They've not been able to do this yet, but if this actual offensive uh, gains ground, then they would probably have the momentum to advance towards these towns. Then they would also be able to use their positions around the suburb of Vermivka to cross the river and attack Velika Novosilka, which is very fortified. It is a re relatively large town, but um, if it is flanked from the east, then the Ukrainians might be forced to withdraw a bit further north. And then Looking a bit towards the city of Donetsk itself, the Russians obviously want to take over Marinka. This could only be done if Novomikhailivka is first taken and then the um, Russians push towards Kostyantanivka, cut off the road access between um, Vukhlidar and Marinka. And then from there, they can advance towards Pobjeda. There have been numerous assaults in the direction of Pobjeda. I think there's even like a mine shaft in that area but no matter what, the Ukrainians have been able to hold on to that area because it is very uh, important strategically because it can be used to flank the um, whatever Ukrainian grouping is centered around Marinka. And then let's say they are able to do that. Then from there, the Russians would be able to attack Marinka from the south, force them to retreat before they get enveloped. And then from there, they would be able to really overrun a lot of the original defensive fortifications that were built up during the war in Donbass. Their goal by the end of this would be to take over Kurakove and reach this um, like small body of water over here. I'm sure they would also be eyeing Andrivka because this is a key command area, key supply hub for the entire southern Donetsk front. Also, of course, they want to make sure there's less shelling of Donetsk and so they would want to actually continue to advance on Opitni and Vodiane. Um, I will talk about these in a separate video because there was also some news from this area. So of course they want to take over this specific area to get good positions to flank Avdivka. This can only be done if Krasnohorovka is taken. Krasnohorovka really uh, is going to be difficult to, to, to take that because it is a very industrial town. It is very fortified. But... Uh, that's probably the best way for the Russians to actually encircle Avdivka. They would need to take over these towns over here that are centered around this road that supplies Avdivka, and that would actually cut off the Ukrainian grouping in this city, which is a very uh, large grouping over here, a lot of fortifications. It is a very industrial city. But anyway, that's all I have to say for today. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you.